So welcome to the welcome to the last talk of the day. Thank you for coming. My name is Brian Duggan. I'm going to be talking about Utiaji, building an application-specific web server in Perl 6. Um, I work for a company called PromptWorks. Um, I'd like to thank them for sending me here. Uh, we're a consultancy based in Philadelphia, um, and I'd especially like to thank them for letting me have this time to work on Perl 6 and do this interesting project. Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, I think uh, as we've seen from the last talk, we're definitely in the golden age of web frameworks. There are a lot of great web frameworks out there. Um, I checked the Wikipedia page for web frameworks recently, and they can't even keep up with the number of web frameworks. It's outdated, and um, you don't get a lot of comparisons these days because there are a lot, and they're great. Um, so here are some of the, the positives and minuses of of web frameworks. You know, they provide a nice layer of abstraction for the web server. Um, they let us write our application, and they handle a lot of things for us, performance and some aspects of security. Um, they also make it easy to add plugins and hooks to various parts of the web request cycle, um, and they give us nice primitives. Um, on the other hand, uh, they can be somewhat limiting sometimes. Um, in particular, um, plugin architectures have their disadvantages, and plugin ecosystems can become unwieldy sometimes. Um, I think uh, a lot of people who have used web frameworks have had the experience of having to rewrite your application after there's a major release um, that has been not backwards compatible, um, even if it doesn't affect your application. Um, so like it or not, a lot of the time an application becomes very coupled with a web framework, even if the application itself doesn't have a lot in common with the architecture of the framework. Um, of course, it's better than the way we used to do things, which was just using web servers directly to write web applications. These are also great. They implement a lot of HTTP, which has become very complicated, and they deal with things like optimization for us. So, um, you know, I think we all, nobody can say anything bad about web servers, except for the fact that when you write things that are based on specific web servers, you also have to deal with changes to the API. If you've ever written a Mod Perl application, um, or if you've written things that hook into various parts of the web servers. And the other thing is that web servers, because they're implementing all of HTTP, they're very complicated. So um, that can make them fragile, and you have to keep up with the latest updates um, in order to be certain that you have good security. Um, so when I say HTTP has become complicated, um, it started out in 1991. We had version 0.9. In 96, we had 1.0, then RFC 2616 came out in 1999, and then in 2014, um, there were some, um, I guess, um, disambiguation of some of the ambiguities in RFC 2616, so we have a whole slew of RFCs, and now we have HTTP 2. So HTTP has definitely become more complicated as time has gone on. Okay, but not all applications use all of HTTP. So here's a quote from Tim Berners-Lee about HTTP 0.9, saying that the restricted protocol is very simple and may always be used when you do not need the capabilities of the full protocol, which is backwards compatible. So a lot of the applications that we see don't need all of the features that all of the web servers offer, or even all of the features that a lot of web frameworks offer. So this talk is about building an application and implementing the part of HTTP that's needed for the particular application. Okay, so that was part zero of my talk, uh, the introduction, and I have two more parts. First one is about the application, and the second one is about how Perl 6 makes this technique easier by providing a lot of the um, uh, relevant semantics and syntax for building a web um, framework or a web application specific framework. Okay, so to start with, this is the application that we're going to be building. Um, it's called Utiagi. It's actually online. You can go to utiagi.org right now, and we'll see what the concurrency is if everybody goes at once. Uh, um, it is a, a calendar. It's a wiki and an address book. So far, the calendar and the wiki have been implemented. 
And it keeps track of how things are connected to each other. So if you add some dates on the calendar and you link to things on the wiki, then it keeps track of what's connected to what. So you can sort of keep track of what's going on in your life. Uh, this is a personal project. It started out in 2005 when I wrote something with CGI, stored stuff with Data Dumper. I put it on SourceForge. It's actually still there. Um, as time went on, I added an address book, lots of other stuff. I rewrote it using Mojalicious and jQuery. I stored things in Redis instead of using Data Dumper. Then I tied it to Google Calendar and used it to keep track of my backups in Amazon Glacier. So it's only fitting that now in 2016 I'm going to rewrite it in Perl 6 as the back end and using React.js as the front end. So my goals with the application are to have something that's very customizable. Um, I change it a lot to keep track of information. And so I rely on it and I use it as a way to test out um, new features and new languages. So we have the latest version of Postgres which supports, which has a native JSON type. Um, we use the latest version of React, which also has a lot of great handling of asynchronous communication with the server. So this is the basic architecture of the application. Uh, we have HTML, and, and um, the browser will send an HTML or JSON request uh, through Nginx, which takes care of the static stuff for us and sends the dynamic requests over to Perl 6, where we render HTML templates, or maybe we render JSON. The data is all stored in Postgres, and that's all there is to it. So this is a pretty simple architecture, uh, but it's actually fairly common these days. Um, a lot of web applications are really client-side uh, oriented, and frameworks like React sort of make um, uh, a lot of stuff in the browser more easy. This is the data model. Uh, it's also pretty simple. Two tables in Postgres a key value table where the value is JSON and a key key table where you map one key to another. Um, there are a few little triggers to keep the timestamps up to date, but otherwise all of the logic for the application is in the application side of things, not in the database. So here's what we need from our Perl 6 application. We have to handle getting HTML, um, we have to handle templating H of HTML because there's a little menu on the top. We need getting and posting of JSON, serializing the JSON, some socket stuff, some routing, modeling our data, and accessing the database. Uh, there's also a little autocomplete search box, so that falls into the same category of posting JSON. Um, notice some things that are missing from this list. Uh, I'm not parsing any forms, I'm not dealing with query strings. So there are some things in HTTP those are just a, a few tiny examples that uh, I'm not implementing for this application intentionally. Okay, so let's go over to Perl 6 and see what some of the interesting parts of Perl 6 are that are relevant to this application. Uh, so first, um, grammars are very useful to handle um, a number of aspects of this application. So the first is the request line that comes in. Um, you know, you have a verb and a path and the version, so there's a request line um, grammar. It starts like that. Um, headers also, I think this is um, one of the examples in the documentation. They're pretty easy. They're name value pairs. Um, you have to be careful about the characters in them, but it's also a fairly straightforward grammar to implement. Uh, templates and patterns are a little bit trickier, but they actually have something in common. Um, so templates for generating HTML, uh, a template gets turned into a subroutine, basically. Um, I think of a template as kind of an inside-out subroutine. And since you can have signatures for subroutines in Perl 6, um, you know, why not have signatures in your templates? So this is an example of a template that has a signature on top and um, an include directive. Um, this style of template with the percent delimiters uh, is also, they're called ERB templates or Mojalicious templates. Um, so um, it wasn't too hard to write a grammar that basically takes something like this and takes the delimiters and then turns them inside out, evals the whole thing, and gives you a subroutine. Um, you know, it starts off like this and the rest of it uh, is in the source code. Uh, routing patterns, they kind of look like this. You have slashes and colons. Um, I also like these triangles, which uh, indicate that the placeholder is a date. So just as a template starts with a string and gives you a subroutine, 
um, a routing pattern. For this grammar, you start with a pattern and you end up with a regular expression. So you just need a grammar that takes the pattern and turns it into a regular expression. Um, so there's a, there's a grammar that takes care of that. It parses the routing pattern and gives you a regular expression. After that, you make a routing table and then you can dispatch your requests. Um, so concurrency, we've heard a lot about concurrency these days. It's very useful when you have a, a web application. Um, the big concept here are supplies. So a supply generates a sequence of values and you can either use tap or you can use react and whenever when you're dealing with a supply. So here's an example of a supplier. Um, dollar Gatsby is a supplier, and you can you can call dollar Gatsby dot supply dot tap to set up a tap, and then you can pass it arguments. The first one is the block of what happens when things come in, and then you have things that happen when um, the uh, supply is empty with a done or if it gets interrupted with a quit. Um, so an equivalent way of doing the same thing is to use the react whenever construct, which looks like this. So you say start react whenever supply, here's your block, and then you have your last and your quit, which are inside of that block. Um, so in our web application, um, that's what we do. We actually have sort of nested supplies. We have a supply of connections, and then within each connection, we have a supply of bytes. So Here's our supply of connections. We listen on a host and a port. We handle the connection. We have to deal with what happens if somebody quits or if we're done. And then when we handle each connection, we have a supply of bytes. So for each, every time we get some bytes, we call generate response, which you know might not generate if the response isn't complete. And then we also have a quit and a last handler inside there. Um, you also have to think about timeouts with your web requests uh, and promises. Take care of that. Uh, though, as I learned today, I may have to increase the number of threads in the thread pool. Um, but uh, it's a simple. <laughs> um, so here, but here, so here's an example of using a timeout to handle the connection being closed. Um, so now onto some of the syntactical features of Perl 6 that make it easier um, passing. When you pass a named argument that's a number, you can cleverly put a colon number and then a name at the end of it. So here's how you can render 404 status, colon 404. Um, the implicit par parameters make it very easy to sort of create anonymous subroutines. Um, these four things are mostly equivalent. You have a, a named subroutine, you have an anonymous one, you have a pointy block, and then at the bottom you have the implicit parameters where dollar caret res is the request and dollar oh, there should be a carrot there dollar carrot uh, rec is the sorry is the response and uh, rec is the request. Um, so if you set up a block like that, you may need to know do they want both the request and the response or do they want just the response? And so you can check the signature of the block in order to figure out how many arguments to pass. So you can say if the signature is one, just give them the response. If the signature is two, give them the request and the response. Um, and you can use that using the signature object attached to the callback, or you can just call count on the callback object itself. So it's very convenient. Multi-dispatch is also convenient when you have different types of rendering. If you're rendering text, you send a, you have a, um, you have a signature that takes the text named argument. Um, if you're rendering JSON, you have a signature that takes the JSON named argument, and same if you're rendering a template. Um, or if you're rendering a pair, you can interpret that as a template. Uh, there are a lot of nice ways to topicalize, uh, assign to dollar underscore for a certain scope with given, with, or for, and that, um, and you can also assign to the match object, which gives you this clever dollar less than, greater than way of accessing things that were matched. And so putting those things together, you have a way of constructing a routing table without having to invent a DSL. Uh, or you might say you've ma sort of made your own instant DSL right here. So you say with setup, you call a method called get, you give it a route slash, and then you give it a block that says redirect to and send it the response. Um, and there you're handling a redirect. Um, or here's another example where you have some placeholders 
and they get put into the match object, dollar less than from greater than and dollar to. So this you can do by accepting the match object as a parameter to your pointy block. Um, so um, with these syntactical features, it's much easier to sort of put together things like this in your routing table. Um, one of the uh, most important things that um, Perl 6 does that helps with this type of thing is deals with um, types, in particular incoming bytes versus strings. So this is very significant when you're dealing with HTTP because you have to, for instance, return the content length, which is the number of bytes, not the number of characters. Um, so because these are kept separately um, um, and you have to explicitly think about encoding, a lot of these issues actually become easier to deal with. Uh, the object hierarchies in Perl 6 make it sort of easy to make these nice fluid relationships between things and manipulate them until they fit your mental model. So we have an app which uh, inherits from a base app. It has a router which has many routes which has a pattern. Um, server has an app. Server does handling and it has dis which does dispatching which has a request and a response. So I didn't use a, use a controller so I don't know if this would be called the MVC pattern. Um, so it's sort of a custom uh, way of just thinking about the request cycle. And using has, has many, uh, is, and does, you can rearrange these things so that the methods compose the way you want them to. Um, also, being able to delegate methods to uh, an object that's an attribute makes it easy to have the router, have the app automatically call the router for things like get, post, and put. So that's what's happening on the bottom there. Um, similarly, for the data model, I have an address book and a wiki and a calendar. The address book has many people, a wiki has many pages, calendar has many days, and then they each have roles such as being referenceable, serializable, and savable. Things that are savable have a database. Things that are searchable have a database. The top level things are searchable. These ones, bottom level things are savable. Um, so you can sort of manipulate these things very easily in Perl 6 because of the uh, very verbose um, um, you know, object-oriented uh, support. Uh, set operations are also useful. Um, set differences, when you have old things and new things, you have to know what changed, so you can subtract the set of, well. subtract the arrays and get the difference. Um, if you want to check to see if your HTTP header is valid, you can use the subset operator. If, is the header a subset of these bytes? Because those are the only ones that are valid in HTTP. Um, I have a few caveats here, some things that I ran into um, uh, during the implementation I thought I would share. So the built-in 2JSON does some um, escaping of Unicode characters, but you can get around that with JSON fast, which doesn't escape it. So you get your beer in quotes rather than Unicode escaped. Um, this can be significant because browsers sometimes handle the Unicode escaping a little bit differently. Um, the single argument rule tripped me up a little bit, so this is a new thing. Uh, in Perl 6, these t the top and the bottom one uh, on the left-hand side are not the same because if you have uh, an array that has a, a hash with a single pair, then it gets iterated because there's only one argument there. Um, so uh, you end up with a single pair inside of your array, which is probably not what you intended. Um, but you can get around it by adding a comma to tell it not to iterate. Um, and finally, um, for testing, I used both Travis and Circle. Um, they both support Perl 6, but uh, most things out there rebuild Perl 6 every time they run the tests on your application. But you can get around that also just by adding a cache directory. So in my Travis.yaml, I put some, I cached the Rakuto brew directory, same with Circle.yaml. And uh, there's a little bit of, I had some trouble with some of the dependencies, so I just made a custom install that just sort of forces installs a few dependencies. Um, finally, I guess my wish list for Perl 6, which I'm probably going to end up volunteering for somehow, um, <laughs> is um, a little bit better dependency management. So I had some issues using Panda for um, complicated dependency management. Um, I would like to see better co coercion, so when I pass some uh, strings into argument that take dates, I kind of wanted them to automatically be coerced into a date, uh, things like that, or matches into strings. Um, the leave seems to be the, the way to exit from a block um, as opposed to a subroutine, but I got a not yet implemented error for that. Um, so those are all things that I would like to see. 
Thank you very much. Um, and I think we have maybe one minute for questions. Uh, so the question is, am I going to try to use that with Apache rather than Nginx? Um, I hadn't planned on it. Um, the only thing that I'm using Nginx for is for doing the static files and for acting as a um, reverse proxy, sending the requests in. So that could be done with either web server. Ah, good to know. If I don't like the trailing comma, I can put a dollar sign in the front. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much.